Where is Bob? Oh, he's there. Okay, good. I thought he was going to come down on wires or something really dramatic. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, um, I met Bob last year because both of us happened to be, at the same time, coming to independently check out and start researching Malcolm Bendel's thunderstorm generator. I heard a lot of buzz about it and was like, what's this? And so we met in the, la the secret laboratory in, in London, and somehow I ended up becoming a sort of lab assistant to Bob, even though I didn't know what I was doing, and I was helping him um, with his investigations. And so, well, Bob, previously, he is an artist engineer who worked in the pharmaceutical and advertising and banking industry. All right, clever. And he was developing uh, and graphic design and animation. Is there anything you don't do, Bob? And then he, um, he transferred that to India, spent some time in India. And in 2012, he pivoted to focus on establishing fact from fiction in the low energy nuclear reaction field of research by volunteering for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, which he helped found. And he runs the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project YouTube, which is a fantastic, and I think in the future is gonna be a historical YouTube channel documenting all of his investigations. So this decision led him along an unexpected path to potentially understanding the eternal rules that run the universe, which appears to be encoded in ancient, revered symbology and our own bodies. He is a wizard and mastery of ancient symbols, so much so that I actually got a tattoo from one of his last videos because I was so amazed by the Seder Rota Square. Check it out. Um, so it's something we have forgotten and we are on the threshold of realizing again. His volunteering continues and he regularly writes about his experiences on his blog at remoteview.icu. Okay, but without further ado, because I want to give you the most time possible, it is Bob Green here, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear the people sing, singing the song of angry men? It is a music of a people who will not be slaves again When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums There is a life about to start when tomorrow comes Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Somewhere beyond the barricade, is there a world you long to see? Then join in the fight that will keep, give you the right to be free. Do you hear the people sing, singing the song of angry men? It is a music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beat, Beating of the drums, there is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. Does tomorrow ever come? You're too kind. Can I have a show of hands for people who've seen my presentations before? Okay, all right, so there's a number that haven't, so I will show you cover slides that you need to look at. Um, to get up to speed uh, in the future. Uh, but I won't go into all detail because you'll be here for the next few weeks. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to be talking about the fractal toroidal moment and the propulsion to the cosmic summit. And what am I talking about? Well, I'm going to talk about something that really changed gears when I met one uh, John Hutchison. And I don't know if you know, but um, uh, earlier this week uh, he nearly died. Um, and his uh, wife did a CPR on him, um, and he spent some time in hospital, but I'm very happy to say that he is home and recovering, so uh, I want your intention and your good prayers here to see here that he has a speedy recovery. I was very upset because uh, I actually looked at probably his most important um, demonstration of the Hutchison effect and on the screen there you see the boundary layer uh, between uh, the steel on this side and the aluminium in what I call the sword in the stone and here you have a yang structure we're in the yang room and here you have a yin structure and this is a 20 micron boundary layer in every yang you have a yin and a yang and in every yin you have a yang and a yin 
And in this room, I have a Yin Gazda at the back of somewhere. There we go, Yin Gazda. Thank you very much, Yin. And she has in her hand a sample from John Hutchison, which she's going to pass around so you can actually touch and feel what the man had created. So uh, if you can just pass this around amongst yourselves. OK. So it's not this particular sample. The sample that I'm referring to here, uh, you can see this is the yang on this side with a hole in the middle and the yin with the bump on it. And uh, you can see the uh, dimension profile here with the hole where the matter is destroyed and the peak where the matter is moved to. Uh, that is the sample. It, it has been cut. Thankfully, it was cut. I didn't ask for it to be cut, but it, that meant I could put it in the scanning electron microscope. And I looked at the end here. Boom! What did I find? On the boundary layer, an iron-rich crenelated microsphere, which is the signature, in my view, of ball lightning. It is the magnetic core of the pseudo-magnetic monopole that's created by the fractal toroidal moment. If you don't know what that is, give yourself a couple of weeks and you'll know by following some of the presentations I'll give links to. Um, so this is an iron-rich crenelated sphere. There's another iron sphere. In this region here, in the boundary layer, so th this is the classic ratio of uh, FeO2, uh, uh, which is a new oxidation state of uh, iron that was found in uh, 2017 by creating hundreds of thousands of megapascals and at 1700 degrees. But of course, this is not happening there, and that's because it's in the fractal toroidal structure. Now, I started talking about <laughs> or relating my work to ancient technology when I went to visit the uh, Amberley Chalk Pits Museum in Sussex. If you've never been there in, in the UK, I recommend you go. And they have an electricity exhibition. There was some Tesla coils, some uh, spark generators, and all kinds of other switch gear and stuff. But I was fascinated at the entrance because they had this shield on the left here. And this is the original, original order of electrical engineers before they had the shield that you can find on Wikipedia. Okay? And that became the IEEE, which is one, became one of the largest uh, professional bodies in the world. And I wanted to know why this symbol was put on this thing with the out, the, out of darkness cometh light. Okay? Well, when I did a little bit of research on it, I found out that this is the symbol of God-controlled power. And that intrigued me. And so I just put it on this slide. And this was the first time I shared anything from past history, and it was on the 9th of June, 2017. You can go and see that presentation. It was in uh, Italy. This is the stele uh, from 814 BC in the British Museum from which that was taken. I took this photo myself, and that is the symbol up close. Uh, it, it's actually 814 BC, but on the side there is cuneiform that references, it's a type of cuneiform that's from a thousand years before. So you can get an idea that this is not recent technology, if this is a representation of technology. The second time I shared something along these lines was in my Sochi presentation to the Russian Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning uh, uh, Research Group in Sochi, in Russia, in the 4th of October 2018. And what we have here is what's called a sun disk. Uh, it's a symbol of a, what they call on Wikipedia a solar cult. And this is from northern Italy. There's many of these uh, structures on the uh, rocks there in this particular region. You can go and look at the links in the presentation when you have it. This is also, and this is about 2,000 years old. This is about 1,600 years old uh, from Ilklimor, Ilklimor Batat, where I uh, buried my grandmother about a couple of hundred meters from this symbol. Uh, and you can see the similarity there is pretty striking, right? Well, to cut a long story short, through changing my research uh, approach uh, and working with the project of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, uh, we, uh, I, I went from looking for neutrons, gamma, uh, uh, X-rays, and beta particles to, with the advice of Francesco Piantelli, who des designed and invented the nickel hydrogen Lena system, uh, to just looking at what nature is doing. And he said, don't tell nature what it is, let it show you. So I did that, and I looked at all these different samples that came from all over the world, uh, and the, the things that we were producing ourselves. And ultimately, I gave a presentation on the 5th of March, uh, 2023, called O Day Another Dimension. I'll come into what the 2D versions of this structure is, but as you'll see there, the basic structure uh, is, come on, oh, on the next slide, which I can see if you caught. Oh, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's here. This is uh, the basic structure with 
two and two and uh, uh, basically if you have one of these structures, a torus, it can only have things going through the dead center. You need two to make things to ta start going in a ring. So the minimum fractal is two, right? And it can be two on every level. Here is a four, four structure, but it's one on the top tier level. Now where this particular beam interacts with the tor level above on the fractal structure, there is a disruption beam that can come out. So you can see it here, it's coming out, and I will show you examples of this from physical, physical experiment. But it's at the intersection of this torsional rotational structure and, and the tor on the level above. Okay, this area here is called the non-radiating boundary. It's very specific, and from that non-radiating boundary, there is zero uh, electromagnetic waves being transmitted when the structure is properly formed, only the scalar and vector potential. Uh, is able to uh, go through here. So this is basically like a Star Trek shield. And when you spin it up, it will vanquish anything. So within a f uh, 10 minutes of finishing that presentation on the 3D structure, I gave this presentation called O'Day, A New Dawn of an Old Age. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> and I was talking to the uh, great George Howard, who has put this together. Thank you. A big hand for George Howard. <laughs> and he said, he said, uh, you know, I like that phrase. Do you mind if I use it? I said, go ahead. Everything's open. It's yours. <laughs> so what I am standing on there is the uh, the great step in the the, the great the gallery uh, in uh, the Great Pyramid of uh, the Giza Plateau. And why I'm standing there is because that is the Chai Ro of Cairo inside the pyramid. And in this presentation, which you can go and see, I show that the same structure I'm going to show you exactly and precisely defines every component in the pyramid. And it's based on the simple, uh, simple geometry, which has the Vesica Pisces, which we've just heard from Jordan. A big clap for Jordan's presentation, please. And in the center of that structure is the, the Christ center. That is, Jesus was given uh, Chai and Rho Christos, basically, in my view, because he decoded this. Okay, so where does the work come from that I, you know, I have been involved in? Well, it comes from Winston Bostick, who was charged uh, uh, from 1948, but of course the, the, the hydrogen bomb went off in 1952, as we saw from Paul's presentation earlier. Big hand for Paul's presentation. Thank you. Uh, and he worked at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory on Project Sherwood with the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And essentially what they did was they, they did uh, high 10,000 amp current discharges uh, from a uh, deuterated uh, titanium electrode. It produced a plasma loop which then magnetically reconnected and it had uh, this poloidal magnetic moment with this electric current here. And he had uh, at least two of these coming together, and in this case you can see eight, and when they came together, this is a torus shooting in from the eight tori coming together, and they go over a magnetic field, and they form a tori of tori. And what he found was, and what he proposed in 1957, is that this could be the basis of structure from all, for all matter, from the subatomic to the formation of galaxies. I would 100% agree with that. And also uh, that he proposed that his findings could lead to ultra-fast propulsion. Do you see where I'm going now? <laughs> 450,000 miles an hour. Now, to put that in context, if you were already traveling at that speed, that's 13 days to Mars from Earth. Okay? So, Ken Shoulders was brought in by one Hal Puthoff to investigate the work of John Hutchison, that you are handling the sample there, and thank God he's still alive. And in the conclusion of his secret book, which we kind of forced into the public, his 1987 book, EV, A Tale of Discovery, this is a strong electron, ele electron validium, uh, he said essentially this is an ideal monopole oscillator and it has no effect with the magnetic or uh, electrical magnetic fields and it has scalar fields and so on. Phase, phase determined, this is very important. This is in 2016 in Nature Materials and look, from 1987, we still don't know much more about this, in the white world. Also, there's one other thing we must say about that. There is emerging in the last few years and has emerged in orthodox science at an advanced level 
what I would say is the very beginning, but it's, it's moving pretty fast, uh, theory of force-free fields. And these are getting very close to what Tesla was doing. They haven't added the anti-wave back in yet, but they're getting close. At least they're eliminating the overall force and doing something else with the electromagnetics that remains. So it, this is a simple structure, which is the structure of a nanopole, uh, and you have oscillating magnetic fields and an oscillating electric uh, dipole here, and that causes, you can see, the cancellation of the electromagnetic fields, and you get the non-radiating boundary at this point. But we're going to talk about things far more interesting, and they are based on these kind of structures, which are effectively smoke rings. But I'm going to be talking about smoke rings that are in the ether. But the same process occurs in any charge-separated material, and that can even be polar material like water, like water. Okay? It's already kind of charge separated, and especially if you have a metal in play, you've got a hydrophilic surface, it rearranges the charges in the water, and then you start spinning that, you end up with these kind of structures forming extremely quickly. So this is actually Shishkin's work, this is John Hutchison's work, this is in a reactor we called Lion, and this is in Dr. Roy Schnamaza, this is HHO gas, but it's very special gas. Uh, and this was a test that we did on tungsten, and this is what you see under the microscope. This was about a 10 second, 15 second test. This zone here is the point of destruction. In fact, that's the point of destruction. That is the interface between uh, these tori and the tori on the fractal torus at the level up. This is strontium. It doesn't exist in the original metal. This is a diamond film. It's ripping the matter apart. It's literally t unwinding that matter. This is a yin force. The yin force pulls matter in from the environment and it creates new life here. Okay? You have the, one, one will be the yin and the yang, but overall this structure is a yin force. It's a winding structure. A yang force unwinds. This is an experiment, and this is an experiment that a three-year-old can learn and conduct in seven minutes. And it works 100% of the time. And on one side, you get heavier elements, and on the other side, you get lighter elements. The yang side rips matter apart. The yin side assembles matter. This over here is a boron crystals in the center of the Visica Pisces on the golden ratio line. And boron is aluminum minus oxygen. And there is no calcium on this side. On this side, in the center of that structure, you have a Calcium without boron, and calcium is uh, aluminium plus oxygen, some of its isotopes. This is exactly the yin-yang structure that forms in this overall structure. It's not slightly it. You cannot improve it. There's no patent anyone could ever make patent for you guys that will ever... <laughs> that will ever... Aluminum as well for you guys. Uh, <laughs> that will ever improve on this. This is a ball lightning and a Henk urine experiment that collided into a piece of fused silica that melts at 1700, just over 1700 degrees C. This is the caduceus, one of the oldest symbols known to man. Okay? This is the symbol, the thing that you've just seen, and this is weird. I saw this in 2017 and it stuck in my head. Why? Because these bubbles, which are making this light reflect from the bubbles that are coming out of a dissolved in the solution. How is it possible that it's all white around here? There must be something pulling in all the time into the center of these vortices. What? Eh? Because this works by depressurizing the water. The bubbles form and the light reflects off them, giving you the white. It also has this depressurization zone down here. So there's a torsional beam that comes down. You can see the torsional beam, and it unwinds matter specifically at this point. And on the human anatomy, it is... I won't go anywhere else. <laughs> okay. All right. So looking at a John Hutchison sample, uh, I found yin-yangs at this quantization level. This is the same structure here and here, but looking from the size you, side, you can see the apple, going, the apple core going through the apple structure. This is from the top. Take that and rotate that from 90 degrees, and there's 48 divisions around here. So these are D4D structures, and they are self-similar and fractal. And so on the 20th, uh, 17th of February 2020, I derived this structure, which is exactly a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. I said at the time in this presentation, which you can go and see, that this is probably the structure of the physical universe. And then I thought, back on that stele that I presented several years before, there was this structure. And then I counted this, and there's 23, but then that's not full 180 degrees, so there would be another one here. So that would be 
24 times 2, that's 48. So I thought, this is literally unbelievable to me. So I went to the British Museum and I thought, what is this meant to be? And do you know what it said? It's the flying disc of the sky gods. <laughs> okay, a little bit freaked out here. And then in Henk Uren's experiment analyz analyzing that, we found these different fractal structures. This is a two order structure with multiple, say 15 around here. This has got 36, this would have 48. This is six around there, this is six truncated. This is only three, like the so-called black hole at the center of our universe, which I believe is one of these structures. And this is a simulation software that one of the followers of the project made, and you can go and investigate this. This is calcium oxide. Calcium, oxygen, and calcium oxide are all paramagnetic. They can live in this incredibly magnetic strength confining structure that self-organizes from plasma. This is copper and this is carbon. They're both diamagnetic. They orbit around it, but they can get transmuted into the center. So I shared these kind of structures, but actually specifically this with the Russian community. I shared this, which was my original structure that I uh, came up with in a download in a dream in January 2018, having looked at the work of the late uh, Neil Crichton Gold. Uh, this was the structure I came up from looking at John Hutchison samples. Then we found the physical things on a plasma experiment, which we called the Vega experiments because there was another one called the Sapphire Project. But anyway, we called it Vega. It was nothing to do with Lockheed Martin's original place uh, that Paul mentioned. And without any comment, I sent it to them on the 30th on the evening. Without any comment, the Russian community came back and showed this paper that was published in 1995 in uh, uh, the uh, Biology of Life journal by one Zverblis. I translated it and blow me down. It had a current ring producing a magnetic field. R rotate 90 degrees, you get an electric field. Rotate 90 degrees, you get this. This is a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. And this was the energetics research in the Soviet Union, right? I don't think it works like this, and you're going to see that it doesn't work like this. I translated this. There was a paper published by a colleague of his, uh, and essentially they produced an electromagnetic phantom in there that when the machine was turned off and the machine was moved, it lasted for two days. They could see, using a Fluxgate magnetometer, the magnetic oscillations in free space, quantum locked into the room in which it was generated. Okay, the guy that discovered this thing called the toroidal moment, this is not an electric dipole, it's not a magnetic dipole, this is called a toroidal moment. In electrodynamics, a very different thing, and it was discovered by him in 1965 working in Russia in the, in the Dubna research, nuclear research facility. Uh, unfortunately, he died very recently. It's a very great shame. I talked to his colleague a lot, but unfortunately, I didn't talk to him. He, this is a, a panic meeting in a room that I presented in in 2015 in the Mo Moscow Friendship University, and he's describing what possibly could have killed the leader of the cold nu uh, nuclear transmutation and ball lightning field, uh, uh, called Yuzhi Bazhatov, and he died doing uh, electric arc experiments on water, and, and he's describing that these toroidal moments, they can literally rip the chi life force out of your body, and that's what he's describing to the people in the room was likely to have killed him. So when you have anything fast to mo moving in a vortex or these things, you need to be aware that there is a zone in which you do not want to be, okay? And this is a, a serious concern that uh, people need to heed. Okay, uh, it was discovered, he was in his thesis in 1967. It wasn't verified until 30 years later in the West. So here is some energetics research from the 1980s using this principle. The yin force here, there's, what you've got in here is you've got a, a copper strip and then it's on, on an a, a insulator and it's uh, formed into a Mobius coil. It's treated with radio frequency and then he hits it with uh, uh, the mains voltage with a high current pulse. And in this case, it's a yin force. It's doing a zero albedo extraction and pulling that energy in, all the chi force from that point in space-time, and pulling it into the yin force. It's not as bright because yin is not as powerful. If you fuse two deuterons together, you get something like 25 million electron volts. This is yang force, and it's projecting energy out at a distance. This is probably a lot of what your ball lightning uh, and fake UFOs are. This is also a fake UFO, right? But you're starting to understand what real what they are. They're not unidentified, they're identified, <laughs> okay? And in, in the case of the yang, it produces more energy because 
according to David Freiberger's research, which was similar to the work of Novesky in, uh, in 1992, but David, David Freiberger, worked, Freiberger worked at Slack, was a ball lightning expert, and in 2009 he says, the structures I'm about to show you, they create a thing called the dialty angle, and when it goes over a certain critical threshold, baryonic matter loses its reference to the Dirac sea, and the baryons fall apart and they, fall, they collapse into light and leptons. This is literally the gods toolbox, which is something I've been calling it with a little g since 2017. Okay, so what is a phase singularity? This is our Mobius strip. At the center of uh, Mobius strip, you have this kind of thing. It's like a, a Penrose staircase. You go around this way, you don't go up. You go around that way, you don't go down. Okay, that's a phase singularity. And this is the phase diagram of a ring soliton. Okay. Toroidal moment, magnetic, you've got a current going around magnetic moment. Rotate that 90 degrees and you, you have a, a ring of magnetic uh, uh, loop here, but it, it's not an electric field gain. This is what I'm saying, it's not quite what you would imagine it would be. It's a toroidal moment. Now things can link together with the toroidal moment, but the toroidal moment can encode information in fantastic ways. And I believe it's the, the, the tool that is used by your brain with your cryptographic key of your DNA using your microtubules and, and the yin and the yang delocalized electrons above those benzene rings in the, in, my, in the microtubules to interact with the Akashic record, store your memory. If you have a brain tumor and have a bit removed and you go to the other side of the universe, you'll get your memories back because they're encoded at all points in space and time instantaneously. So. Uh, but very basically, this is on uh, um, the, uh, this one is on the Lion Reactor. This is on the Lion Reactor. That's my logo from my uh, blog. Uh, this is in Science in 2011. This is a uh, oxygen atom, copper, 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 uh, current loop, current counter loop. This is the toroidal moment. It's a real thing that people are starting to understand. This is the basic structure. This is copper oxide. Guess what? This is copper oxide. They've got a theory, we've been making it for real. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is from uh, Scandinavia. It's a beautiful example of the flower of life. This is something that Johanna did some fantastic videos on. I recommend you go and watch those. This is uh, the flower of life supposedly somehow laser etched onto the uh, Temple of Osiris in Abydos, Egypt, which is possibly a very old structure. And this I had the pleasure of putting my hand on when I was 18. Uh, it's on, in the right paw of the food dog in the central temple uh, in uh, Beijing. And this is the, the, the 3D structure of this 2D representation. So when you make your 3D structure, your ball lightning here, and it's energized sufficient, it will do this. This is a piece of standard copper pipe on an iron plate. We have this on video. A hemisphere formed and instantaneously made that copper disappear. Now, to give you an idea, if you take the whole earth and you put it into a black hole, it's 12 millimeters across. So that bit of thing, the matter might be there somewhere, or it might have done what Freiberger was suggesting. It completely collapsed. But the interesting thing that you'll see about these structures is that around the boundary, all the interesting things happen. So I'm looking under the SEM and I see a two order structure with a vortex, a three order structure with a vortex, a four order structure, but it hasn't really got the vortex going on. I mean, there's still a twisty thing going on, but it's not spreading out like this, okay? Five order structure, six, it's really a, 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 a fixed beam, and then eight, well, it's starting to have substructures. So. This is a two order structure. This is a piece of German work in ultrasound. You have the, your, your yin and yang center points there and you have the ring, it's pulling material in and this is one side and another side. These are the beams that come out. This is on a Crichton Gold's experiment. This is a, a, a nickel diamond and deuterium Lenner experiment. This is a 1969 NOAA picture with these flares going off in this direction but this extremely fast uh, air coming in here. Uh, and this, I believe, the water spout is caused because the toroidal moment that comes down and destroyed that tungsten and ripped that matter apart is changing the way electrons happen here. And this is water gas produced by weakening the polar bonds between water molecules. It's not boiling it. And it's lifting it because of weird stuff. <laughs> okay, and this is the structure you see there. This is the three order structure. And this is on a Roy Namaza vibrator plate. This is a yin and a yang 
vortex. This is the oval structure with the triangle coming down. And the crazy part about this, it's got triangular holes. And in the corner of the triangular holes, there's a little sphere, which are these little spheres that get synthesized. This is on a Neil Crichton Gold, and this is on a, the uh, Vega experiment. Here is on the Neil Crichton Gold experiment. You have a four order structure. This is the four order structure on the Henk uh, structure. And here is the four order structure. And you can start to see these structures in very, very many religious buildings. Okay? So, the swastika sticker, or salva sticker, the yellow bits are my additions to the Wikipedia quote, symbolizes lightning bolts, ball lightning, representing the thunder god and the king of gods, such as Indra in Vedic Hinduism, Zeus in the ancient Greek religion, Jupiter in the ancient Roman religion, and Thor in the ancient Germanic religion and Scandinavia. This is five. So that was, that was a swastika there, what you're seeing here. And depending on the rotation, one will wind, and it'll be a yin, and, and, and if it's going the other way, it's unwinding, it's a yang. So here's a five order structure. Here it is on uh, the uh, Neil Crichton Gold. This is on Malcolm Bendel's inside of his 24 inch sphere, and this is in the Henk urine. So th this is a Lenner, pure Lenner deuterium experiment. This is in a charge separated, uh, internal combustion engine, and this is in a hydrogen uh, low pressure air plasma environment. So, this is your six order structure. I've separated out, and what do we see here? We see the cell unit of the flower of life. Over here, that's the six, and there's a lot of sixes. Why? Because, if we go back, the four order structure is the first time that the disruption beam kind of starts to go into the non-radiating boundary of the, of, the, of the adjacent one. And so it kind of starts to come out, but it doesn't quite make it. But if you go to the five, this is well within the non-radiating boundary. So it's well linked. So most stable structures are five, but the first stable structure, i.e. God's toolbox, little g. God's power under control. God controlled power is the swastika. I'm sorry, it just is. Uh, and then the six is super duper under control. <laughs> okay, so um, this is an interview you might have seen in the previous presentation this morning by uh, Paul. And uh, it's an interview between Eric Weinstein and uh, Hal Putoff, who's naval, US Naval Intelligence. Uh, Russell Targ revealed that last year. And basically, uh, uh, he's, the, Eric Weinstein uses that Penrose staircase to describe the phase singularity that allows for the Aronhoff bomb effect, which was discovered in 1954. And that allows you to create coherent matter at any temperature, not at near absolute zero that like they did the, in the late 1990s to create Bose-Einstein condensates, but literally at any temperature up to trillions of degrees. Okay? So, uh, and he's, he's saying that this is the only way you can change um, the constants of the physical vacuum in order to get around the, the, the limits of uh, relativity using the Aronhoff bomb effect. And in response to this, the next edit is like Hal kind of ignoring what he says. And he says, and you can go way beyond that. So there are all kinds of toroidal geometry is where you have no electromagnetic fields whatsoever, but you have strong vector and scalar fields. And since you have no Lorentz force in the absence of E and B, how can you detect them? Well, you detect them by any kind of quantum detector. Who's got a quantum detector? Who's got one? You need to all put your hands up. All of you, because you have a brain. I hope so, anyway. <laughs> So he describes uh, uh, Josephson junctions, which use quantum tunneling. Now, Harold Putoff, I don't know if you know, he ran the psychic spy program for the CIA uh, during the Cold War. I translated the person, Dr. Alexander Parkamov, who was a leader in the psychic spy program in the Cold War in Russia. Uh, and basically, Nine months after he handed over this technology to the pseudo-government entity, private entity, Science Applications International Corporation, where anything useful was put so you couldn't do a freedom of information on it, um, basically, he, in, in the, that was in 1992. Uh, in 
August 1993, he uh, applied for this pattern. This is a, a, a toroidal coil one way, a toroidal coil the other way with an electric field oscillation potential between there. This, whether he mentions it or not, is producing a toroidal moment. Now, I feel weird next to our Lenner experiments. I'm on record before I understood any of this of saying on, re on live videos, I feel a bit weird near to this reactor. I'm not sure I want to be here, right? Someone sent me this from June the 15th, 2023 at Sydney Technical University. They're using magnetic resonance imaging and they are finding that during conscious tasks, in conscious state and cognitive tasks, they have a magnetic vortex and an anti-vortex. And that, whether they like it or not, whether they agree with it or not, will produce a toroidal moment, which means John Hutchison could feel his experiments. Could he man manipulate them? Maybe. Maybe every one of you in this room has the ability to manipulate matter. Because matter, at the finest level, to galaxies, is made with these structures. So, this is from 1992, Athenaeus F. and Dubovic, some remarkable current, charge current structures. They are doing all of the mass. All of the mass has been done. Don't say, I want to see the mass. It's already been done. <laughs> Before the West even woke up. They are so far ahead, it's literally embarrassing. Right? It's so embarrassing. And they say here that inside the torus and inside, obviously, the fractal tori, you will have the Aronhoff bomb effect. And this allows you to do um, the coherence of matter at any temperature. And I would refer you to systems and methods for creating coherent matter waves. It's a patent awarded to Lockheed Martin in 2013. So. In 1979, my father asked me and my three brothers and, and my uh, sister to come downstairs one late uh, evening in the summer. And I'm going to put the microphone down and I'm going to shout. He said, kids, look up there. So we're all lining up in a row and, and, and we go, uh, what's this about? <laughs> and uh, in the sky, four lights went... And he said, right, kids, now you can go to bed. <laughs> I was seven. I never thought about it until a few years ago. <laughs> so I never thought about that until a few years ago because I was seven. You don't think about it. It's just pretty lights in the sky. But pretty weird, don't you think? So it was even weirder when last year someone sent me this. This is a paper that you can download from... NASA's website. It's on an intergalactic transport propulsion system, right? And in this paper, it says it's based on their observations of UFO technology. And every single thing that you've seen in Congress, so-called revealed in the last year or so, is word for word in this paper, which you can download, right? So if you haven't been paying attention, it's already been said a long time ago, right? And what you've got here is a current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop, current loop. You've got magnetic fields recombining re -com into create a vortex at the face singularity at the center there. That is exactly the same as that structure. They don't know it's a toroidal moment. They don't mention a toroidal moment, but that's what it is. It's the bit of electrodynamics that you're not allowed to know. Right? Now, in that paper, they referred to this 1976 study where they fired a laser into nonlinear plasma and they produced fields of over 1,000 Tesla. Now, to put that in context, MIT got very excited when they created a superconducting magnet a few years ago and it was 50 Tesla for fusion in tokamaks. This is 1,000 Tesla, one laser pulse. They replicated that in 2021, basically funded by everyone on planet Earth. You're not allowed to know about it, but they're researching it. Right? And you know what happened? What you've got is this here is 1,300 Tesla, and in the center you have 1,300 Tesla coming up to a dead stop. That is your phase singularity. That is the magnetic core of what is ball lightning. And that's the thing no one's allowed to discuss. Radiation, a pencil of radiation, carries energy with it, and energy has mass. And therefore, a pencil of radiation must exert some attraction on things beside it. What about getting a pencil of radiation curved into a circle so the light goes round and round, then the attraction it exerts is concentrated as if at the center. 
So what is it that bends this circle, this pencil of radiation into the circle? It's the gravitational attraction of the pencil of radiation itself. That was the idea of the jihan. Actually, if you think of different possibilities for the size of that jihan, bigger or smaller, you find that if it's very big, the energy is low. To push the radiation together requires energy. And you climb a hill like the hill of a volcano until you've come to a maximum energy. And then if the pencil of radiation becomes any smaller in size, the energy starts to go down and the thing collapses. So a geon is really an unstable entity. It either blows up into a cloud of radiation traveling away in all directions, or it collapses into a totally collapsed object, something that we today would call a black hole. But that stability analysis I didn't have in mind when I first published this work. Only later did I see that that's the feature that's dominant. But nowadays, I'm attracted with the idea that this pencil of radiation going around in a circle does not have to be light. It could be gravitational waves. And you can have gravitational waves imploding to make a black hole. And that is what we've done. Bold claim, but we have the facts to back it up. The experimental facts you saw earlier. This is what you have with the phase singularity. This is a topological monopole. It was predicted and then found in Alto University. It's not like you imagine a real monopole, magnetic monopole, but this is a topological monopole. Now, this is the axial hypertoroidal moment as presented in Physical Review B in 2014. Now, I want you to observe some things here. When you have an electric field of megavolts per millimeter and you have it going one way, you have rotation of the magnetic moments one way, and when you have the field, it switches into another stable state where the vortex goes around the other way. Look what we found in an excess heat production device that was published on the 2nd of January in Nature Scientific Reports. I co-authored this paper with Bin Zhuan Huang at Taipei uh, University. This is what we found. This is an apple, this is an apple. That's the core structure in the sacred geometry structure. This is a yin-yang in a yang and a yang-ying in a yin. This is a pair. They would then fractally build. This is phosphorus, carbon, and copper, and we have literally shown that, that these structures can strip uh, 200 nanometers of copper. We've got the copper wrapped around in a wave function as it stripped it from the material. You don't want this thing flying into your body. It's carrying matter, it's carrying fantastic energy you cannot even begin. Now in 1992, and this was, I found this on the CIA archive that was made public in 2017, there was this flight to Alpha Centaurus document and it says that this is the same as cold fusion, bearing in mind that was 1989, this is 1992. They extract energy from metal and directly generate electricity which enables them to close the loop yielding effective a cop approaching affinity until all the fuel is in the new phase and it also enables propulsion and they said to get with it to Alpha Centauri in six years using one kilo of iron. Now on the right here you can see structures that we produced in our uh, Vega experiments and there's three structures here which do not care about the anode here and the overall chamber being a cathode, they only care about each other. And you can see here, there is a forward facing beam here that's causing this one to move around in, it, in its future path. It projects out in front of it, in my view, a gravitational wave. And if you get two or three of these into a loop, it will produce a gravitational loop, which will produce the next fractal toroid gravitational beam 
in, in, in the azimuth of those three that are in a loop this way, that will increase this gravitational azimuth, they will pull it in, this will get stronger, they will pull it in, and you'll get a black hole event. We've been able to control these, uh, and so I will play this now. On the left you see the outside of the reactor, we've got a tube, and this is the bottom of the tornado that's interacting and instantaneously turning the uh, steel to orange, and when it moves away it stops being orange. I believe this is because it's ripping the electrons out of the metal, possibly carrying some other metal with it, probably creating iron-rich crenelated spheres from that process. And as soon as the tornado is removed, the, the electrons spread around within the metal and it stops glowing. But on the right, if you go through this, we have a copper tube. It's very specifically I chose copper because that is copper oxide. It is one of the best materials other than yttrium to produce the photoelectric effect, the actual thing that Einstein got a, a Nobel Prize for. Um, and uh, if I go back and see that again, we are producing these things which are stable for a couple of seconds. This is the tori, and you're actually looking through the ball lightning. But because of changing the exposure, we can actually see inside, and you can see the tornado that comes down from the bottom that's feeding it. Okay? Now, when you see that flash, what's happening is that's firing off towards the anode, and this is the anode, and these are the impact marks. And if I press play, you can see this anode here, and my colleague uh, Henk Urin will go in, and you can see when it comes up that it has this structure with a fuzzy bit outside. The toroidal moment can attract toroidal moments, right? But uh, not ordinary electromagnetics. So outside of the boundary layer, this non-radiating boundary, you have these things that are trying to join the Borg. <laughs> and uh, you can see here, and this is, in my view, I have not been able to test it, but in the center here you have a bit of the copper that's been stripped from the copper pipe. Here you have a six-point structure, you have a four-point swastika here, you have a multi-point here, and this is a simulation. This is exactly equivalent, in my view, to the impact marks published by 1980 uh, by Bostik and Nadi at the end of their attempts to create the hydrogen bomb into domestic fusion. We've got far better imagery of that same process. So this comes to a little bit of crazy. This is a presentation where I delved into this a little bit further. And it's about the so-called Rotus Sator Templar Magic Square. And if you're not familiar with this, this is the longest unsolved uh, palindrome or whatever you like to call it. And it's rotational symmetry and, and stuff. But to cut your, the whole story a lot short, because you can go and see my presentation on how I broke this down. Ball lightning, iron core, these are the elements, cal calcium and silicon, that have been observed by a peer-reviewed published paper for a signature of ball lightning. This is the structure. And here you can see the caduceus coming into the center, the, the cup of the caduceus. This is the iron-rich crenelated sphere that would be here. And this is an iron sphere that comes from the substructure on the fractal level. And this is, what's this? This you also see on those Sumerian st stelae. This is the elevation of the flying disk of the sky gods. So you've seen, you've seen the plan, and this is the elevation, and they're in the same position. And here is the structure, right? But this is self-similar, and it works at any scale. So how does this, the symbol of the sun god, and this, the sun god symbol, and the power, you know, the god control power with your little circle in the middle, how does that relate to our 444 structure? Well, it works like this. Exactly and precisely with a D4D ratio on the fractal structure, and it exactly matches where the non-radiating boundary interacts. It is literally impossible that this is chance. Somehow, they 100% certainly knew this, and they employed it. If you go to the old Macedonian coins, the caduceus is a symbol of trade and transportation. Think about it. So, this is the Sator Rotor Square, and these are the rota rotational parts of the substructures of the fractal structure. And what does the Sator Rotor Square mean when you translate the Latin? The divine creator comprehends and works with whirlwinds, slash tornadoes if you're in America. And there's one word here that, that, that doesn't translate, and they think it was just put in for no good reason, but it has an A in the actual correct uh, alpha sense and the O in the omega and rep is a shortened version of a Latin word that means repeatedly. So if you add that in, you get the divine creator from alpha repeatedly to omega comprehends and works with whirlwinds. In my view, this is my hash at solving this. I think it's solved. This is from a Sumerian lantern. It's meant to produce light. 
10,000 to 1,900 BC. This is about the time of the cataclysm that we're all talking about next door. This is a yang and a yin on a Hutchison sample. Okay? Destroying matter, producing a, a cavity, and dumping matter down. Okay? Same structure. Now, this is very important I show this correctly. You have the, the ring, very importantly, in the correct location. This, we've seen many, many of this particular structure under the microscope and under macro photography. You have one of the auspicious symbols here. And over here, you have incoherent particle pairs, and they're embossed. And they're coming here on the outside of the auspicious symbol. And out from the center line, you have a debossed coherent particles. This is possibly 12,000 years old, and it's showing exactly how this process works. This is the George Van Tassel's Integratron. It has 16 wood sections. It has a Tesla coil in here, and these things come out, and maybe something was meant to be attached from there. Each, of, each section of 16 has three divisions. That is 48. There is our fractal torus on the outside. This was designed to be able to look back into the past for echoes uh, stored in the Akashic record and to be able to read back into time and be able to look across time to amplify the natural ability of the human to do remote viewing. And apparently some aliens came down and landed in the spaceship and told him how to build it. This, boom, is in New Mexico. Now, I was sent this earlier this week. I couldn't, you know, I'm sorry, I can't remember the person that sent it to me, but I immediately recognized what I saw. And look at this little chappy up here. And look at this. So where you'll see this is, it's on the boundary of the Navajo rain region. But of course, in the center of the Navajo region is the Hopi Reserve. Okay? Now, when I did a video on the uh, Nan Madol, the construction techniques used in Nan Madol, I was then told afterwards the legends about these beings coming down with the plasma being and moving, moving these things and these guys moving it around like Coral Castle. Um, and, but I traced using Google Maps under sea, uh, uh, like uh, elevation maps, there was tunnels or, or a raised area going all the way to the West Hawaiian Islands. And that was very interesting to me because around about 2012, someone was staying with me and we just got into a conversation and they said, my girlfriend uh, was a diver instructor to the elite in the Hawaiian Islands. She would take them out to special trips to these places or off limits. And she saw these things flying around underwater and coming out of the water and going back into the water. And she started to talk about it. She is no longer with us. Five years later, I had another person staying with us. They were coming for fertility treatment, and I recounted this story, and the woman who was from Hawaii, he was from California, said, I told you, I saw them a kid, as a kid, and I saw them when I was 30 years old. I told you, see, it's real. Okay, so after I gave that presentation on Nan Madol, some wrote to me and said that in the, in the Hopi legends, when the, the, the land was flooded, the hoi polloi, they were sent off on ships, but the elite, they flew on these uh, disc-shaped craft uh, to the Americas. Okay? So, when I saw this, I saw something probably no one else sees other than me, and that's my affliction. I took a high-resolution image here. Thank you, Google Maps, for providing this data. And you can see another, this is, a, in my view, a stylized Maltese cross, which is also a very important uh, Hopi symbol along with the auspicious symbols. I don't know when this is made, but I actually don't care whether this is a prank or it's real because of this. That's the salvis sticker in this case. It's the moon. Can you see it? The non-radiating boundary exactly and precisely from many, many different pieces of research over the last 12 years is actually marked on the landscape. And it's exactly and precisely in the right place. Not slightly, exactly. So you see this is the fourth order structure here. But if I rotate that so you can see it laid down on the landscape, the top flat part of the apple exactly lines up with the box. This goes up to the apex. And this goes down to an extra line that they put down for the top of the Visa Capisces. There's more than one. <laughs> 
And I want you to play a little game with me. First, first up, it gets a hurrah, right? There's another one. I want someone to look at that QR code and tell me where is the nearest town to this? What is the nearest town? So you've got, you've got a bitly here, and you've got a, a, a location here, long to latitude, and you can just go to the QR code. Sorry? No. Very good, Roswell. Very good. You couldn't make this shit up, right? <laughs> and you can go and look at this on Google Maps, and you can go and look at this one, and look. The non-radiating boundary is also very faintly and exactly and precisely in the correct place. And on this one, if you rotate it, the non-radiating boundary is exactly and correctly in the right place. I found that out yesterday. So Stephanie, I'm sorry I changed my presentation in the middle of the night, but I, literally, I thought, I wonder if there's any of these non-radiating boundaries on the other structures that I found. These are all within a few uh, tens of miles, I think 50 miles of Roswell. Okay? Are they made by the Hopis? I don't give a shit. <laughs> right? Because there's some crazy dudes out there that are making exactly what it is and what it should be, what nature tells you when you look under the microscope. There you go. Non-radiating boundary. Look, if I go back, it's exactly and correctly in the right place. Again. Right. This is how you make an ARV. This area here is where you see on our experiments it does not affect matter outside of this part of the central part of the structure. That is why they fly off the ground at that height, right? This is the safe part. It's the little notch in the Ukon Fasara, Thor's hammer, which is exactly cloned by the Tesla logo. I mean the one that I saw and photographed in Helsinki's National Museum of Finland, right? With a notch, with the ridges over the top, even with the little bits that curve down to meet the golden ratio spiral of this 200 million year old ammonite, right? That, if you see one of these crafts in the air, you will see visual distortions, torus-like, on either side because of the way it works. It has herxite quartz, which is one of the highest dielectric constant materials. This is from Mark McCandlish in a personal email that he sent out to just a few people. And it has over 1.2 million volts, which the thickness of herxite quartz can maintain as it's drawn. There's eight sections here, but can anyone guess how many sections there are around it? 48. Yay, it's 48! <laughs> Why? When we were doing the modeling, we found out that if you go beyond 48, the structure would fall apart. Just as the guy that worked on the Manhattan Project, John Archibald Wheeler, and who was the tutor of Feynman, said in that video that I showed earlier. So this is basically how it works. This, in my view, the, the re reason it's this high off the ground is because of this. And you can spin this up to a level where it won't cause your matter to fall apart but it will still kind of sh allow this thing to float indefinitely, right? And there's patent records, patent for you guys, out there. And this whole effect is called magnetohydrodynamics, and this is a UFO design from 1967, and it's called magnetohydrodynamic propulsion apparatus. Okay, and you have these corona rings to allow for the magnetohydrodynamic effect, and by phasing these with your capacitors, you can change your pitch and your... This is the British Railways Board, awarded patent from 1972, the day, year I was born, for those that wanted to know. Uh, <laughs> and they have a nuclear reactor in here. It could be fusion or whatever, but that is to create particles. You see, this one needs an atmosphere. This one doesn't. This can work in all atmospheres. And they also have a capacitor array to phase the relationships between the toroid that's made. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers of the Summit 2024, all of the donors of MFMP, all of the researchers that have worked with the MFMP. 
My colleagues past and present, especially Matthew, Ryan and Alan, supporters of my personal research uh, blog at remoteview.icu, Charles Ste Stephan and many donors. And I'd just like, before we get to questions, if you've got any questions, you can also find out about conference where you will actually be able to do experiments and physically see some of these experiments and many more John Hutchison samples. Uh, if you look at this QR code, we'll go to bit.ly alchemyo. So I hope you have a good lunch. <laughs> wow, well, how much time did I go over? Um, you're over, but, but uh, people... Okay. Lunch, so we're going to break for now for an hour for lunch, but find corner Bob and ask him. I'm sure you answer any questions. Any questions? That people have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So this is an addendum and update with some important additions for the presentation that I gave at the Cosmic Summit 2024, which, by the way, was the best summit or conference that I've ever been to. But uh, moving on, uh, I want to start by just a quick refresher of some of the things that were discussed, a little bit of an expansion. Uh, and if you go to this bit.ly slash od dash ad, you can see this another dimension presentation where I revealed how I decoded the 3D structure and then found that it exactly fitted into physical observations in experiments. So part was coming from the observations to the structure and then finding that the structure was an exact fit for many other future observations. Anyway, uh, this is a N level tour here, this is an N minus one level tour, and this is an N minus two level tour. This is a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. And as I said, the torsion comes out and where it intersects with the tour on the fractal level above, there is a disruption zone here. And that would also follow for the subtors. Okay. Now, a l quite a bit of the focus of the presentation was on the four subtor structure here, also known as the Maltese cross or the swastik, salva stick, and we looked at the one here on the Neil Crichton Gold Lion 1 reactor. And you can see it also here on the Hank Urian outside of the 15 millimeter ball lightning cut with a square hole here, with a square hole in the middle, and no vorticity. And so what I am saying in these things is, uh, and I've aligned this correctly, rather than as it was in the presentation, the disruption beam comes out, but the double layer on the non-radiating boundary, it kind of isn't able to really exit out fully through the wider non-radiating boundary because it gets pulled in to the sub-tors non-radiating boundary. So it gets the power under control and it doesn't bleed out so much as it does in a two-arm and a three-arm spiral galaxy. There is a little bit of coming out, but uh, not very far. Okay, and so this is effectively the swastik or sour stick. This is the reference from Wikipedia. And this symbolizes lightning bolts. And as we know from Ken Shoulders, all lightning bolts have a ball lightning at the front of them. That is actually the bolt. And this represents the thunder god and king of the gods, such as Indra in Vedic Hinduism, Zeus in the ancient Greek religion, Jupiter in the ancient Roman religion, and Thor in the ancient Germanic religion. Okay. The key point about these structures is 
that their toroidal moments, in fact their fractal toroidal moment, leads to the Aronhoff bomb effect occurring in the center of a tor and by extension as it is the same below in the sub tor here and as you go down and so this allows for coherent matter to be formed as claimed by the Lockheed Martin patent which you can have a bitly link here and you can go and see this paper here and see this Aronhoff bomb effect discussion in this bitly link here so and the important thing is electrons have a toroidal moment so they can be pulled into these structures and affect a much larger toroidal moment and this leads to a phase singularity here which we discussed uh, which leads to a pseudo magnetic monopole at this point okay and this is the flow pattern you see here on the back wall here and this is a front projection of how these things look and you can see that it's kind of polygonal to a degree almost octagonal here I guess one two three four five six some maybe uh, I think it's, it looks a little bit octagonal or even seven-sided but they form a range of substructures anyway um, you can see that this is 1.3 thousand Tesla if you go and look at the paper which I've given a link to down here bitly link and also the 1.3 thousand Tesla sort of ISO magnetic potential is in the center here okay coming up to a dead stop it doesn't go through and that is the phase singularity this is caused by a laser pulse into a greater uh, uh, sorry a laser pulse into a nonlinear plasma as was done in the 1976 work in Japan and producing a over thousand Tesla field and if you look at this chart a little bit closer you'll see that it's a 3.6 trillion volts per meter charge separation on the leading edge of these structures so you can imagine it does a little bit of messing up of any ions or neutral atoms that it comes into contact with so this in my view is essentially kind of like the core of a ball lightning um, and you can see the density down the bottom here um, so it's a very nice chart this we see here so I've got a close-up or a better arrangement of a couple of the images that I had in the presentation as well there is a four sub tall ball lightning impact here that's collided in from the top okay black 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 and it's a little bit off down here um, and so this would be a swastik type structure with the white bit in the middle and so this is kind of like hitting ring on and this is ring to the side and in this case you can see the non-radiating boundary with a fuzzy bit on the outside and this is the sacred geometry structure so how does this tie in to the ancient symbology this is 2000 years old this is let's say 3600 plus years old many 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 thousands of years probably before that and this is pulling things in so it is kind of like a yin force uh, these are solar symbols and energetic symbols and how does that relate to the structure well it relates like this and exactly the d4d structure and the intersection between these non-radiating boundaries are defining the shape here so d4d and here the non-radiating boundary okay all right 
So how does that play with the Rotas Sata square? Like so. And I will do an image of this with everything sort of oriented correctly because you kind of have to like flatten the tenet down and then kind of rotate these towards you as you go round this way and then you end up with all of the vortices going into the center and therefore making this a, a yin structure uh, pulling matter into the core here into the n the unchanging n and so we concluded that it is the divine creator from alpha repeatedly to omega comprehends and works with whirlwinds so in my presentation i showed a series of images from the new mexico mexico grasslands south of a very famous place for UFOs, Roswell. And if you actually look at all of those places, uh, Roswell and Artesia, I think it is, and and um, Carlsbad. Carlsbad is actually a place in the Czech Republic uh, which has got springs in it, I believe. And Artesia is actually an artesian well, isn't it? And, um, well, Roswell, I guess, is a well. And so I think these are a series of places where they are able to extract groundwater from, they're effectively mining it from under the ground. And so it makes these places habitable in the New Mexico desert, I guess, or, or very arid areas. And you see over those areas, these kind of like circular farms, which are typical from mined water regions. You see them in Saudi Arabia and so forth. Anyway, uh, this sour sticker structure here has a number of features and when we overlay the sacred geometry this non-radiating boundary distance here comes up and of course that is based with the n-level tor exactly placed inside this circle and so here it is the n-level tor is exactly placed inside this circle and this outside area here is exactly on the non-radiating boundary okay so when you rotate this it has the box here exactly and precisely on the span between the two tangents from the curve on the apple and this line comes up to the point of change of tangent and uh, it doesn't seem to have any other significance other than that. It has this other line down here which joins up to the top of the Visa Pisces. And I kind of pointed to this. Um, I didn't go into it in the uh, main presentation. Actually because I, I, I saw it as being relatively significant but I didn't actually clock at that time. But I gave a hint in the edited presentation by applying this Thomas Banyakia, I'm sorry if I can't say that correctly, who's one of the last elders of the Hopi people and he's talking about the Hopi prophecy here and you can go and see a couple of videos. The original key presentation was given in or recorded in 1989 and this is from a presentation in Las Vegas in 1995 and I subtly pointed to this structure here okay and of course this is a yin according to him in this presentation uh, and the next slide I showed was this overall structure is this structure here and uh, I will go into more details to how that is the case and he says that this is the yang okay so this is the material going in and this is the material kind of coming out okay um, and this one he literally calls this thing an atom bomb as he's pulling it out 
So on one side it has this yellow yin and on the other side it's got this yang and he talks about you have to keep the whole world and universe in balance. Okay, you have to work with nature and keep things in balance. Okay, so very specifically on the Saturday after I got back I did a presentation to uh, Math Easy Solutions group and in there I highlighted what I had missed to highlight in Cosmic Summit 2024 that when you place the sacred geometry structure in this orientation so it's lining up with this and whatever the subtor is exactly the same size as this and this is on one side okay and it is a yin structure so this is going in whereas this would be a yang so it's only really relevant to have it on one side the level of encoding of the knowledge in the structures in the desert is utterly phenomenal in my opinion and it's not just on that one it's on this one as well so you can see it's in the center line the center line goes here the center line goes here and it is in both cases correct size for the sub tor so correct sized sub tor outer dimension placed in correct line on two of the salva stickers okay so female on female yeah correctly only on one side showing inflow cross so this is the inflow cross extent of cross at half d in from the 4d outer diameter so uh, if you've got the 4d outer diameter it's here and it's half d in uh, from so that that was one little d and this is 4d it's half d in and this is actually correct this is exactly how it works um, so whoever placed this in the desert was sending a very strong message and we're going to get on to likely who placed these in the desert and for what putative purpose they were for um, but i just want to go more into our Hopi leaders talk here and be more specific in terms of lining up his claims so the first one on what he calls the atom bomb okay is this one and the amazing part about this is that the overall diameter is that of the main tor so the outside of the yellow or the white is the outside of the main tor here okay the span of the ends of the cross is that of the lemon length so this span here okay which is in the center of the d the diameter of the small diameter of the overall torus here of the n level torus this span here and here and here and here is the length of the vesica pisces from here 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 and here respectively this absolutely cannot at all be a coincidence and then the cross this which he refers to the blood of the uh, uh, woman giving birth okay uh, the female force the cross is the line of intersection of the non-radiating boundaries of the four sub tor structure a swastik or salva stick in this case so here this intersection the point of if you look in plan where this non-radiating sub tor boundary interacts with this sub tor boundary is from here to the center point here and that is exactly from uh, this line this is this line here okay so the the fact that he says that this is their traditional culture to make these things every year and you know respect the earth and 
you know, it's it's uh, balance and stuff. And he calls it the atom bomb, um, which is I, I I don't know why he chose that context, but to reiterate. This diameter, the large diameter of the N-level tor is the large diameter here. The halfway in the sub-tor here is at this point, this point, this point. Sorry, in the uh, main tor is this point, this point, this point, this point. And the length of this, it's just mind-boggling that that is the length of the Vesica Pisces in the subtor structures and that the intersection between the non-radiating boundaries adjacent to each other is this line here now when we go to the rotated structure here what you see is that it has two on each side of these crosses and i believe that these are here the inflow or representative of such for the sub tours okay and you'll see that it's in line in this case roughly because they have this pole going through the middle they actually have to squeeze the division cross division cross and then that's in the way of that, this one actually being at the bottom you can imagine the next one would be a division then it's cross division cross and and that might be the full ring as it were so the point is that this is definitely drawn on the center line okay and it definitely has a cross there and so i think this is very accurately describing the subtor structure i don't think this is chance i don't think this is little pretty decoration for no reason whoever drew this knew exactly how these structures work okay um for the sake of argument this is kind of round the wrong way but anyway it doesn't matter um, because the yin is actually here so the yin force is here but anyway looking at the back side uh, we have uh, the yang and th this the between the outside of the white here and the inside of the black white here is D so the the outside of this white as on the other side is at this point on the outside of the end level tor and the inside of this black and white piece here is the inside of the N level tor that cannot be coincidence that is very very precise and of course as one can imagine that this is flowing around here it's moving the uh, spin material around here and so inside that's going like that but of course this is male force it's, it's coming out and so it's coming out around here whereas um, this one is going down around the outside okay so it's coming up here in the inside all the materials coming up it's not coming all the way up like it goes in on the inflow on the outflow it comes out into the side and then it's pushed down and so you can imagine how this might be a representation of what is going on yes this vortex here is pushing stuff that way and this vortex is pushing that that way so effectively it goes that way and that way in both cases but it's different in that the in on the inside it's coming up and out and on the outside it's going down okay so absolutely astounding in my view now the swastika itself is extremely important to the indians um in fact for too many cultures around the world but here is a photo uh, at this link in a to article called a much maligned symbol and this is a 1926 photo of a family in Chamayo, New Mexico. A Native American blanket here in the background depicts an image of the swastika. Okay, all right. And over here, uh, we have a lecture by Dr. Richard Meltzer, Regents Professor of History at University of New Mexico, August the 2nd, 2017. It's called the swastika 
in New Mexico culture and history. I think it's actually a salver sticker. But anyway, um, New Mexico History Museum, and you can see that at this link. And this is a get uh, this link rather. This is a, a kind of I think it's a blanket or a, a rug or something. Okay, so um, it's not an unusual thing to be as part of this region of America. Now, looking at other places of interest in New Mexico, you have uh, a town called Swastika, which apparently uh, in this region is a Navajo word or symbol for good luck. It's very similar in India. It's a symbol of, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and this was in New Mexico, and it was first prospected in 1917, okay? But I understand it existed before. Of course, one that is very, very important to the atom bomb, let's say, is the Los Alamos National Laboratory, New Mexico. And this was founded in 1943 to conduct the Manhattan Project. And you kind of get the sense that, like, did they do it there because there was some actual knowledge there? Did someone discover something there? You know, was it, was there some knowledge that allowed this to go ahead? And I don't know, it's just a bit weird that that Hopi tribal elder would actually refer to this sacred object that they make culturally and use every year he would call it the atom bomb and it is so precise in the sacred geometry and if you haven't seen it you can see a tactical nuclear weapon test where they fire this thing and it produces an incredibly beautiful plasma uh, torus in a very similar fashion to you see being made by dolphins underwater so anyway the first atomic weapons test of course was called trinity and it was conducted near almagoro gordo <laughs> almagordo god i'm probably going to get this wrong sorry um new mexico on july the 16th 1945 okay and then of course in 1949 sandia national laboratories albuquerque new mexico was set up but more than that, there were Air Force bases at Kirtland, Holloman, Cannon, White Sands Missile Range, of course. And this brings me to the point where you should consider if there is possibly a completely innocent but accidentally, uh, amazingly accidentally um, found the same structure. And that is that in New Mexico, there was the Roswell Army Airfield. And during World War II, uh, it became, I think, uh, Walker Air Force Base, WAFB, uh, during the Cold War. So Roswell Army Airfield during World War II and Walker Air Force Base during the Cold War. Okay, so during World War II from Roswell, which apparently, at the time of its closure, on June the 30th, 1967, so well after we had our supposed, uh, well, well after the nuclear uh, bombs were detonated and the hydrogen bomb was detonated in, uh, in the Manhattan Project's further testing, and possibly, I would argue, after most of these technologies were, that, were, that we're talking about, I think, were understood. And the Aronhoff bomb effect in 1954 and the work of Bostix, let's say, first published in, in, in uh, Gusto in 1957. I believe the anti-gravity craft was produced in the 1950s or 60s. And so this would be at the end of that period. Um, at that, the end of that period, it was the largest air base of the United States Air Force Strategic Air Command. And after that, uh, after it was closed, it was called the Roswell Industrial Air Center, and it was developed. Okay? So, during the Second World War, it was used 
as a precision bombing uh, site, the area, the grasslands around it. And in fact, all of these uh, precision bombing ranges um, are listed in this uh, place here. Uh, these military in installations with hazardous sites. And uh, in particular, it would appear that Walker Air Force Base, which is the place after the uh, was during the Cold War, yeah, so after the end of the war, um, there was a lot of testing of bombs there. Normal sort of ordnance, okay? So Roswell is somewhere here, okay? And there's a, there was, I think there was another air base down here, but this is the main area around Roswell, okay, where there were these precision bombing areas. This is actually for the White Sands Missile Range, and this up here is Kirtland Air Force Base, okay? So you can see most of them were around here, and in fact, what they did is they took a plow and they plowed these targets into the deserts which were typically like bullseyes like a ring within a ring within a ring okay a bullseye and you then flew over these things and tried to hit as close as you could to the center however it has to be known and you know i asked people in my presentation during the plasmoid day to not take anything that I say is gospel and, you know, do your own homework. I may be wrong. I often am. And so I did a bit of research after I gave the presentation on the Saturday following coming back from Cosmic Summit 2024. And during that uh, bit of research on the Sunday, I found that indeed these were bomb targets okay so this video here which you can go and see here is a guy that actually visits one of these targets in fact he visits one of the swastika targets and um here you can actually see a bomb stuck in the ground here and in some some cases there's a pile of bombs most of these bombs were dummies they were just sand filled ordnance which were dropped and then they would go and see where they were dropped and actually what they did is they plowed the ground and in the plow marks or the raised areas they would cover it with lime to accentuate the targets as it were um, by pouring the lime on the ground and I did more homework in that I you know there is this article here about ships of the desert and there's the link to it and I thought, well, you know, let's say that this is a gunship and it's got two guns here and two guns here and some stuff in the middle. Let's go and see if there is a German gunship out there that was similar to this. And in fact, I found this one, which is a H or J, a Frederick de Gross or, or uh, Gross Deutschland, uh, 50,000 to 64,000 tons gunship. And it says here that it's 820 feet by 118 feet. For those of you in Europe, that is 250 meters by 36 meters. And actually, from my image, I calculated that indeed, this is exactly 250 meters long. It's actually wider than 36 meters. So it was a generous target. But um, I could argue that this is a gunship. So, the question is, when were these produced? Um, no, no one has come back to me and said, oh, have you considered these are targets? And so I was glad that I found that. And then I had asked Bob Higgins, a former director of, uh, sorry, a former researcher with the MFMP, who lives about one hour away from one of these swastika targets, uh, to investigate what they were and he came back to me on the Friday or Thursday after 
uh, I had worked this out and started building this presentation on the Sunday uh, to tell me that uh, they were targets. And that's okay, because we know from Nikola Tesla that he hid his knowledge secretly in his 1935, I think it was, photo for the weapon to end all wars. We know 100% certainly it is not a coincidence that he has half of the circle of life on the lampshade, the arrangement of the vortex and the anti-vortex slightly above one another, with the particles coming in from one side and the other, and the fact that he has the flower of life cut off exactly at the point where the uh, interaction stops occurring in the Visica Pisces. Absolutely, completely and totally precise. Hidden in just a press photo. Okay? So could it be that the people that were in the desert, in a place where there are swastikas, uh, that they did the Manhattan Project, that they did the atomics weapon test, and that at Los Alamos, from 1948, Winston Bostick was charged with converting uh, an energy source from fusion or whatever into uh, a domestic energy source. So, and, and reported in 1957. Could it be that they understood that and some people that understood that decided to put into the desert the structures that we were talking about at the conference that have exactly and precisely the non-radiating boundary in the correct place when you put the N-level tor in position. And that when you rotate that, the other structures on this unit line up precisely with the Visica Pisces here, with the line out to the uh, tangent to the curve on the main apple, that this lines up here, that this is in the center line, the cross is correctly placed proportionally, and that when you look at this, it is the same size as the substructure, and it's not just on one, it's on more than one, and that this matches the Hopi atomic bomb. And of course, it matches the God-controlled power. The order out of chaos that is caused when you blow things up with an atomic bomb and you create a vortex and a ring soliton. The only two things in nature that are negentropic, that allow for creation from whirlwinds. And so the question is, is this just an innocent bombing target? Bearing in mind that a very large number of the bombing targets are just bullseyes, but there are these few that are this very specific shape, which show, in the case of the two that I've showed you, the not only all of the major features of the sacred geometry structure, which I believe defines these technologies, but also goes to the trouble of showing the, the substructures, which are in the Hopi atomic bomb. So is it bombs or is it something that shows knowledge that has been known for a phenomenal time? A phenomenal amount of time. So here we go. There's our Hopi Atom, atom bomb, and here is what I would consider the most powerful thing in the universe. And here I've, I've aligned the Henk Urian impact mark of a ball lightning on fused quartz with the one in the copper oxide. And so you can see how this feeds in, uh, this feeds in. In fact, 
it has these three sides here so does this have this three sides but it actually doesn't have one here and this kind of doesn't have one here which I think is interesting and then it's got kind of like the square hole with the kind of square hole here it's uh, very very interesting how precise these are and again this one is very similar looking in a way to this one H how this actually forms is I'm firing in Masaryk University here in Brno high energy electrons into this copper oxide here and what's happening is the copper oxide is supposed to get excited and emit photons that will tell me this is copper and oxygen okay but in fact I'm not getting any photons back I've just got like a black mask so it's it's sucking in the electrons and keeping them for itself and so you just get this black swastika here okay so that's what's causing that and that is something that you see live because you're firing electrons at it this is what you see under the scanning electron microscope and this under macro photography so there's a mystery was this a case of someone in the know and we know that this is was the most important you know air force base it says here it was the largest base of the United States Air Force Strategic Air Command. Okay, We know it was called Walker Air Force Base during the Cold War. And that if you look down here, Walker Air Force Base nearby Roswell is the number one high risk. So it's around here, these kind of three spots. And Roswell's somewhere here. So... I would be interested to see if these couple of these four spots are actually they do actually look almost exactly where these swastika ones are. So I might do a, a an overlay of these ones relative to the um the uh, swastika structures to see if uh, they align. But uh, yeah, Walker Air Force Base is the post World War 2 name for it uh, so we also have Walker Air Force Base here and Walker Air Force Base here Roswell again and these are all Roswell okay and these are all the medium risk and at least one of the high risk the highest risk is Walker Air Force Base so is it just a bombing site or is it that someone that was involved with Los Alamos National laboratory research and who is connected with the work developing the anti-gravity craft and or developing the work of Winston Bostick who also worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory did they speak to some people and they say you know why don't you make your next bomb target uh, look a little bit like this drawing okay a little bit like this drawing here with this thing around the outside 16 subdivisions just as you saw on the integratron and put this over here i think that would be a good place and put, make sure you have this thing in a box right make sure you have that in a box i'm not telling you why and it needs to be this distance away and just put this random line in here okay just I don't know why but just put it in okay and we'll have another one down here all right just put the, another one down here could it be that all of this is a uh, purely coincidental coincidental that this is exactly in the right place coincidental that uh you know this is in the right place coincidental that these are in, you know is it all coincidence in making a bomb target or is it that the people that were working in the desert on these technologies decided to encode that information into the desert? So with that, I will say thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.